Amen. Amen. Pastor John. Well, thank, you, Jackie, thank you, Sister Jackie. Thank you, Sister Jackie, for all of the songs that you presented to us this morning. We thank God for all of you who have joined in the service of our Lord 
in what we now uh, have known for quite some time, of course, Passion Week or Palm Sunday, which we are approaching, approaching and here. We thank and praise God for each and every one of you. And I know once again, as I always say to you, that God has a word for you in the in the service this morning. Though we have done Palm Sunday for years, God still has a word for us to take from what he has gone through. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would hear and receive from from God this morning, whatever it is that he has for you. It's a word that only he can give to you to help you in your pilgrim's journey. But dear Lord, our God, once again, as we sit in our tent door to hear with us, say the Lord, I pray that you give your church an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord God. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. In Jesus' precious and most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. Amen.
did it all for us. Amen. Amen. Well, happy and blessed Palm Sunday. God is so good and his mercy endureth forever. We thank him for allowing us to be here for this Palm Sunday service. It is March 24th, 2024. And we're at Mount Moriah Community Church's virtual service where the pastor is John P. Sheckett, Jr. And again, we thank you for God touching your heart and you coming to join us here to worship and to fellowship on this blessed Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Palm Sunday is a day we remember and celebrate the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem as Savior and King. Amen. And I'm going to show a short video just re-emphasizing the significance of Palm Sunday and how it's still relevant today in our lives. Amen. Amen. A week before his resurrection, and just days before his crucifixion, Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem. He did not enter that city like a king. There was no chariot, there was no mighty horse. He entered that city on a donkey. Outside the city, the crowds gathered around to see their king, and they laid their palm branches on the dusty road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna simply means God save us. And that simple prayer echoes across time. 2,000 years ago, the Jerusalem crowds shouted Hosanna to their king on that dusty road. And 2,000 years later, wherever we are, we shout Hosanna, even still. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna in the lowest moments. Hosanna in the green pastures. Hosanna in the darkest valleys. Hosanna in the crowded cities. Hosanna in the open spaces. Hosanna in every church. Hosanna in every home. Hosanna in the victories. Hosanna in the failures. Hosanna in the beautiful beginnings and Hosanna in the bitter endings. Hosanna in the days of trial. Hosanna in the days of plenty. Hosanna in the days of sadness. Hosanna in the days of celebration. Hosanna in the morning and Hosanna in the evening. Hosanna in the sunshine and darkness. Hosanna in the years of waiting. Hosanna in the seasons of blessing. Hosanna all the time. Hosanna everywhere. Hosanna forever. Hosanna to the sun. 
Hosanna in the highest. I was told that you didn't see the video. No one saw the video. Oh, no. That can't be true here. <laughs> but everybody heard it. Ah, uh, yes. All right. The video was powerful. And I don't want to, I might show it after service, but it was a powerful video. I'm so sorry about that, but I'm glad you got an opportunity to hear it. Mm, mm, mm. That was some good stuff. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Amen. We're going to move right along with the service. Thank you for letting me know, please. If something goes wrong, please let me know <laughs> right away. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I am going to go right into our announcements. And I'm sure everybody sees this. Amen. Amen. We do have a few announcements here at Mount Moriah Community Church. And for one, this coming Tuesday is our Women of Favor Fellowship. Please join us Tuesday, March 26th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Our lesson slash discussion will be the glorious resurrection, the glorious resurrection. And that information can be found on our website. The link is there as well. So again, looking forward to seeing all of our women at our Women of Favor Fellowship this Tuesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And this coming Friday is our Good Friday service via Zoom, of course, March 29th at 7 p.m. We will be remembering his sacrifice for us and the last seven last sayings of Christ will be expounded by seven dynamic speakers here at Mount Moriah Community Church. And we do hope you'll be able to join us in this beautiful celebration of Good Friday. Amen. Yes, it was a Good Friday. Amen. So again, information is found on our website. The link is there as well. This Friday, I'll repeat, this Friday, the seven last sayings of Christ, that is our Good Friday service. More information can be found on the website. If you'd like to more, know more as well, you can feel free to contact myself here. Lady Sheket. <laughs> Amen. And of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, March 31st. Again, join us for the celebration of resurrection. We would not be here if our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did not rise for the, from the dead. Amen. And this is the reason for the season, the celebration of his life. Amen. He is still alive and well, and we're so grateful for that. So come and join us next Sunday, March 31st. Celebrate the Savior. Amen. God bless. And yes, this is the month, month of March, and we are still honoring Women's History Month here at Mount Moriah Community Church, Women Making a Difference. And we will be focusing on one particular woman. And her name is Carol Hobson. And her motto was never let go of your dream. Amen. Carol Hobson is a captain on the Boeing 737 for United Airlines based in Newark, New Jersey. After a 20 year career, that let you know it's never too late. After a 20-year career as a journalist and executive for iconic brands like National Football League, Foot Locker, L'Oreal Cosmetics, Carol followed her dream to become a pilot. 
Amen. So again, never let go of your dream. You are never too old to uh, do something, especially with Christ in your life, because we can do all things through Christ. Amen. I have a short video on um, Carol. Amen. It's coming up next. Hope you enjoy this. And I know you'll see this one. <laughs> Amen. God bless. The friendly skies haven't always been friendly for women or people of color. According to 2020 federal labor statistics, about 3% of Af aircraft pilots and flight engineers are black or African American and under 6% are women. One of the few women pilots of color is Carol Hobson, who flies a Boeing 737 for United as a first officer and she was inspired to become a pilot by the story of another black woman, Bessie Coleman, the first African-American woman to earn a pilot's license. Now Hobson has written a book inspired by Coleman, one she hopes can help her mission to diversify the aviation industry. Which way is the wind coming from? Coming from the left, look at that nose. Very good. In the cockpit, soaring high above, Carol Hobson has relinquished the pilot seat. She's mentored Silver Ford for the past six years. She had a lot of runway, 6,000 feet, if I remember. Where were you before you met Carol Hobson? Uh, before I met Carol, I was a freshman at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Honestly, in the process of uh, going to classes, trying to figure out how I would afford flight training. Tuition was approximately 40000 a year. Flight training um, fees could be as much as 20000 But Ford is now an official flight instructor and will soon become the first black woman pilot in the Tennessee Air National Guard's 164th Airlift Wing. So your students come out and fly here? Oh, sure. In these planes? Absolutely. This is one of our airplanes. It's all possible through the Luke Weathers Flight Academy in Olive Branch, Mississippi, named after the Tuskegee Airmen and first African-American air traffic controller. So my role is a um, cheerleader. My role <laughs> is to help bring awareness of the school, to fundraise, in order to get 100 black women through flight school. We estimate it's gonna be about $7 million. Courtney Gillespie is one of them. When she met Hobson, she was working as a lifeguard to pay off a six-figure student loan from her time in aviation school. She said, look, you're going to have to make a plan, but I have somewhere where you can probably go that's going to help you out, but you're going to have to make a way to get there. And so when she finally gave me like that little light at that end of the tunnel, that kind of where I can start to see my journey going, I really took it. I took it and I grabbed onto it. This nonprofit program cuts flight training costs by two thirds, thanks to Hobson and her fellow members of the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, including Captain Albert Glenn. I'd like for you to meet Michelle How you doing? Miller. Michelle, nice this is you. my mentor. He mentored you. When you see her mentoring other students, how does that feel? It feels great because, you know, it's that finding those diamonds and then watching them shine, you know, and given the opportunity and being able to put together a school and then being able to put monies, you know, in the hands of those who need it to be successful is, it was a dream. As a United Airlines Boeing 737 first officer, Hobson has become a poster pilot for access. I am living proof that it is never too late to follow your dream. A former journalist turned human resources executive turned stay at home mom, Hobson deferred her dream of a professional flight career until the age of 50. So there are 100,000 people who fly for a living, there's 7% who are women. Two to 3% are African American. That number has not changed in 20 years. Less than 1% are black women. Many of them, her co-workers, General Stacy Harris, Teresa Claiborne, Claudia Zapata Cardone, and Andrea Weeks. But before them all, there was Bessie Coleman. So she becomes the first American to go over to France to receive a civilian certificate. Yes, she's the first black female. And yes, she earned her certificate almost two years ahead of Amelia Earhart. Hobson's novel, A Pair of Wings, is based on Coleman's 34 years of life, mined from archives 
and black newspapers of her day, showcasing the aspirations of this 20th century pioneer. I began to think about what I would be able to do with all of this flight training when I got home. Would I truly be able to open a school and do for the Negro? Where in the world would I get the airplanes, even the students with money to pay for their own flight time? For Hobson, looking back allowed a way forward. So we got gear down. To make Coleman's dreams a reality. I was always reminded that where she walked, I had the option to take the train. Where she took the train, I had the option to fly. Where she took a ocean liner. My life was greatly improved because I stood on her shoulders. What do you hope the book conveys to the audience, to hope. the reader? Hope. Hope. There is never a time when you don't have options. To dream big and to put dates on it. To not give up. A mirror to those aiming high and yearning to take off. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. So cool to see yeah. that relationship. Amen, amen, amen. I thought that was an amazing story. Again, inspired me that you're never too old. Never too old to do what God has for you to do. So again, remember, women, or whoever you may be, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. That's Philippians 4.13. Be inspired um, by her, but most of all, be inspired by what you can do through Christ. Amen. Amen. Right now, we're going to have our scripture reading by our Elder Roy Stewart. Good morning, Elder Stewart. Well, good morning, Sister Jackie, and good morning, Mount Mariah. And let me say this about your video. And we thank God for those that paved the way for those that will come after. Amen. This Amen. morning, reading from the Living Bible, and it'd be from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 34. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, my time has come. The glory of God will soon surround me. And God shall receive great praise because of all that happens to me. And God shall give me his own glory. And this so very soon. Dear, dear children, how brief are these moments before I must go away and leave you? Then, though you search for me, you cannot come to me, just as I told the Jewish leaders. And so I am giving a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I love you. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Roy, for the reading of God's word this morning. Right now, we're going to have our Elder Rhonda Sheckett lead us in prayer. Praise the Lord. Again, good morning, First Lady morning. Jackie Sheckett, and to all the elders, the pastor, Mount Moriah Community Church in Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you, O Father God, for another Palm Sunday, recognizing, O Father God, we can never, never, never forget what you have done for, ah, da, 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 for us. Glory to God in the highest. Thank and you, thank Lord. you for putting together our little church, Mount Moriah Community Church, for your glory, Lord. Lord. It's for your glory. Continue, Lord, to minister to every listening ear, every beating eye, every mind, oh, Father God, that you get the glory out of every vessel. 
Continue yes, to bless us to fulfill all the assignments you've given us on this side of heaven for your glory. Continue to pour out your spirit upon the surface today and be glorified. Yes, Send Lord. your healing power. Minister to our hearts and our minds, our souls and our spirits. Continue to strengthen us and make us better for your glory yes, that we can Jesus. shine for you as the brightness of the day, O oh Father God. Continue to bless us that we can bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Rhonda. Thank you, Elder Rhonda. Amen. God bless you for your prayers. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Let us pray. Precious Lord God Almighty, holy, holy and true. Once again, thank and praise you for blessing us and allowing us to present ourselves before you, Lord. And as we come before you, Lord Jesus, once again, we ask you for your guidance, direction, and strength. We ask you for the things, Lord Jesus, that will allow us to attain and reach eternal life. Eternal life with you, Lord, as we come to your house from Sunday to Sunday, whenever there's a service to remember you, to study you, dear Lord, my God, preparing us for that day where we can, yes, celebrate you and see you face to face, the God of our salvation, dear Lord, my God. Continue to lead us out in the way you would have us to go, that we may forever bring glory to your name. And help us to live a life, more perfect life before you, Lord God. And Lord Jesus, as we prepare to hear your word this morning, yes. I say, Lord God, always give your church an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus, precious, most holy name we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Once again, we thank God for each and every one of you. For God has touched your heart to want to come, come to find out and to hear more about what God is, who he is, and how he can touch your heart to lift you above your circumstances, your situations, to take you through another day. Another week, another month, another year of this life so we can keep it right before him. And this is why we come. We come to prepare ourselves as God prepared himself. Amen. We are preparing ourselves as well. Amen. Think about us as we don't know. But God, in his infinite grace and mercy, coming into this world, he knew what he came into this world for. He came into this world to die. We didn't come into this world to die. We don't want to die. But yet and still we do. And that's because of, we know the rebellion that happened so many years ago in the Garden of Eden. But Jesus came to die. And as he came to bear witness to us about what he needed to do, once again, the enemy was on his trail from the beginning tried to destroy his life before the time so that he would not be able to fulfill what his father wanted him to do. It's the same thing with us. The devil doesn't want you to fulfill what God has for you to do. He has something for each one of us to do. Amen. So I know that this is coming up to this is Sunday. So we're coming up to Passion Week, which is called uh, the week that leads up to our blessed Lord and Savior's crucifixion on Friday, which is Good Friday. But I just want to set the groundwork a little bit as to what has transpired in the life of Jesus. We're not going to tarry long, but we just want to touch base with a little bit. Because God prepared himself from the very beginning. Not just the Passion Week, but from the very beginning. And we know we don't have much information, but we do have this uh, one occur occurrence, if I'm saying it right, 
um, when Jesus was 12 years old. And um, it comes from the book of Luke. And it's chapter 2, starting at the 41st verse. And I'm reading this just to give us some background of what is taking place. Amen. Before we move on. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And, and, and uh, the Passover is something that Jesus fulfilled at the end of his life. Amen. So all of these things are leading up to this point where he would have to give himself up for us. Okay. Meanwhile, he's fulfilling what was laid down on record once a year that had to be done. Verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, 12 years old now, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among his kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking after him. And I would assume like any parent that is missing a child, they were frantic. Uh, going out, especially the mother. Mother's always frantic. Going out of her mind, saying, where is he? Where is he? He's not amongst us. What happened to him? And so we read on. And when they found him not, they returned back. For verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days, they after three days of getting back to Jerusalem now, he's already been missing a day in the day's journey that they took. So now he's missed four days. He's missing four days. So you know what starts to happen. They'll never be able to find him. I mean, think about even today when a missing child is, right? If at a certain period of time the police say, you may as well give it up. This is not going to be a rescue. This is going to be just a search to find the body. For so four days have passed. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. 12-year-old boy, obviously, when you're 12 years old, you don't know much, but he's able to talk to these doctors of the law and all of these that have these bonnets on and these long robes looking distinguished and whatever, he's putting them to the task of scratching their head is, well, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know uh, it, what, what you're talking about, you know, uh, <clears throat> and reasoning amongst themselves because of what the 12 year old boy is saying. Now let's go on. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. 12 year old boy. And when they saw him, this is the parents now, were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. You know, uh, when a parent first finds the child, you know, they're, they're checking them out, make sure they're you're okay, they're, you, you, you look good, anything broken, anything, you know. And once they find out that you're healthy, whatever, then that's when the switch comes out and you get uh, whipped on the backside a hundred times. Once you, once they find out that you're okay, <laughs> but this, this did not happen to Jesus. All right. They, they were sorry, but because Jesus answers them this way. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Oh, my Lord. You know, talk about scratching your head. I can't imagine that they're his parents or the earthly ones responsible for him. Let me put it to you that way. Must have taken a step back and saying, he's, he's doing his father's business, but his father's a carpenter. Uh, what, are, what are you talking about? Uh, oh, God. Then Mary has to remember what, what the angel told her. Uh, Oh, God. And then with the angel came to Joseph, said, fear not to take me to be thy wife. And so these things 
going through their mind. Oh my God, must be about my father's business. We we are looking at who? We're looking at God. God has been our son. Oh my Lord. You know, can you, I can't, I can't even imagine as a parent finding out that who you've been nurturing, who you've been looking after is God of the universe. I mean, can you hold on to that for a second? Can you possibly just think about that and wonder, oh my God, can, I, I, I got to make sure I get this right. But they took all of that into, at least married it into her heart to remember what had taken place in her life when she conceived the child. And that here is Jesus now confirming at 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. Wow. Ah, takes your breath away. Let me tell you something, church. It takes your breath away. It takes your breath away when you have come to the knowledge, some knowledge, all right? I, I believe he is not hardly all knowledge, some knowledge of who God is. When you've had some experiences with God and to hear that uh, Mary and Joseph were not just in the midst of God himself, but they ate with him. They, he, she fixed him food for Pete's sakes. She held him in her arms. God Almighty. Ah, 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 ah. I mean, how can you possibly live? Um, I mean, you've gone beyond the top of whatever you can achieve in life. If you, she's uh, just holding God is more than any one can consider on this side of life. Oh, she, it's it just boggles the mind. I mean, I mean. I don't know about you, but it, it's causing me to wonder, uh, you know, the grace and mercy of Almighty God. He allowed man to be able to hold him in their arms, hold his hand. Uh, you know, it just goes beyond any kind of knowledge that I have. But we bring it up to, to the point from where Jesus leaves this temple. And the scripture tells us that he had to be subject to his parents as any other child, but because he was God, he still had to be subject to his parents. That was what was given to him until the time came for him to start his ministry. All along, his ministry, to me, is part of the passion Part of the struggle of getting to this week that we're getting ready to get into. All of the teaching that he did. All of the healing that he did. All of the sermons that he preached. All of the teaching that he did was bringing him closer to the point of Passion Week. Because the struggle was there all along. Because of the people denying who he was. The struggle was there each day, even with his disciples, to try to help them to understand who he was, even though he was showing them through the miracles who he was. And trying to get them to realize that the greatest thing you can accomplish is love one another. It's like, what? The greatest thing you can accomplish in this side of life in the world is to love one. No, it's not a career. It's not a career. It's not large money. It's not being able to go around the world a hundred times, go to the moon or whatever. It's to love. If you can love one another, you have accomplished more 
and anyone with all of the trappings that this world has to offer. If you can honestly love one another. And the reason why Jesus puts it this way to them is because it's so hard to love. And it's because of sin. Sin has caused us not to love, but to hate, to fight, to kill. You look at all of the different things that you see that man has accomplished. Along with that, there's always something attached to it that has to do with killing something. The shedding of blood. That's where man's heart is at. The shedding of blood. So as Jesus is coming along through his life, the life started, well, the ministry started at 30. At three years, compact all of what life is about, eternity is about in three years. In three years. He eventually gets to the point where it's time to go into Jerusalem. But not just to go into Jerusalem. I'm going into Jerusalem as the king. Because he had been in Jerusalem already. But he didn't come in as the king. Now he comes in as the king. The scripture tells us that in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 5, It's a triumphal entry. It starts out, uh, like I said, verses 1 through 5. And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Beth Page, the Bethany, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, See, all of these are miracles. Don't overlook them, church. All of these are miracles. He tells them to go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a ass tied and a colt with her loose them and bring them unto me and if any man say aught unto you ye shall say the Lord have need of them and straightway he will send them just tell the man now remember now an animal back then was like a Cadillac Okay, can you imagine somebody coming up in your driveway telling you, I need the keys to your Cadillac because the master has need of it. And that man is going to give you his Cadillac that today probably costs about $80,000. <laughs> but that's what that man did. How does that happen? God has a way of, of, of getting into you that you have no clue how he moves on the heart of you to just give it up by just his word. And, and Jesus didn't tell him directly. He told his disciples to tell him. That's how powerful his word is. His, his word was used through somebody else, but it was still his word. That's why the preaching of God's word through preachers is still relevant because it's God's word that's coming out. It's not your word, it's God's word. And that's what moves on the hearts of man. Not a, what the preacher, his own personal feeling about it, but it's God's word coming forth. And so that's why he was able to just to lose. All right, go ahead. Take, not, don't just take one, take both of them. You know, uh, take the uh, take the SUV as as well as the uh, the the CTR and the the other one that's over there. Take them all. God, you know, we'll have it. We'll we'll just give it all up. God, you want it? Take it all. It all belongs to you anyhow. I don't have it unless you gave it to me to begin with. So this owner of the the donkey, the mule was willing to give this up without any problem. 
because God now is getting ready to enter in to Jerusalem as the king. And what's significant about how he came in, you know, they say, you know, he came in on a donkey and that, you know, what, what I mean, that looked kind of low. I mean, what about a chariot? Why didn't you just get him a chariot? I mean, you know, and have somebody drive the chariot. Well, you see, the chariot is a Roman symbol. The donkey is, is a symbol of Israel's king. That's the difference. If you read scripture, the Old Testament scripture, you will see that every king uh, of Israel rode on a donkey when it came to uh, being anointed as king. And that's why the representation here is to replicate that. And if any man asks thee, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt and put them and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I'm going to explain what this is all about. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. These people shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Remember when Jesus says, Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. I don't care if you know me or you don't know me. Everybody's going to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Those that are going to be cast into hell for eternity, even they're going to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. For those that through God's grace and mercy have made it into heaven. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Everybody's going to see him and everybody's going to glorify him. That's what Jesus said is going to happen. So this is a, an example of what is going to take place in that great day when, once again, unfortunately, those that didn't make it are going to be standing there in the judgment, having to say the same thing, whether they want to or not. They're going to have to give God glory. Yeah, in their lifetime, they didn't want to give God glory. They wanted to live and do whatever they wanted to, but now they have to. Even though they're still going to go to hell, they're going to have to give him glory. How does that happen? Well, God has a way. That's all I got to say. God has a way of moving on you, whether you like it or not. Because he said every knee, not some knees, every knee. I don't care what your title was on the earth. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. So let's get that straight right now. No one is going to escape glorifying me. Amen. So God, in the midst of this, his life's not over yet. It's getting there. But all of this is in preparation of him coming to that point where he has to give it up. Because after this time of being brought into Jerusalem and hailed as, as the king, he goes back to teaching again. He goes back to preaching again. He goes back to telling the people what he was telling them before. But now he's been acknowledged. See, before they didn't want to say nothing, but now he's been acknowledged. He's gotten from the people what he, what he needed to hear from them. Irregardless them, of them turning on him in a week or even less than a week and have him crucified. But all of these things have to take place in order for the scriptures to be fulfilled. Amen. He cleanses the temple uh, with those that are there to sell uh, goods. And that's, you know, when I when we had the brick and mortar, that's one of the things that I, I was having difficulty with. Uh, even though, you know, you had a basement, you had the sanctuary, it was still the house of God. 
and to use any portion of that to as a fundraiser to me was a problem you know and, and see this is where you start uh, as a preacher you start rubbing folks the wrong way because they're used to doing things their way you know what i mean they're used to having fundraisers in the church they're used to doing things like that and all of a sudden you're coming along saying well god came into the temple and he saw them you know uh selling stuff and he turned the tables over he said don't make my father's house a house of merchandise and you've been doing that for how long 30 40 years and, and who are you to tell us what to do you know and see this is where conflict comes in this is why church is divided when you want to do the right thing you know you're forced into a situation where people don't want to do the right thing. They're locked into traditions. They're locked into the old way of doing things. Instead of following scripture, they're busily diso being disobedient to scripture. Amen. But if we would be obedient, God, you wouldn't even need a fundraiser. God would be pouring, sending money. If you had a heart to do what God wanted you to do, you wouldn't have to have fundraisers. God knows how to touch the hearts of men to give, to just let it go. And I'm talking about not, not nickels and dimes. I'm talking about thousands of dollars. The world does this, people. The world has donators that donate millions of dollars, all right, to charities and so forth. We in the church, we... Uh, uh, well, I I don't know. I, I, I you know. Uh, oh man, we are tight. <laughs> we are tighter than the rope for Pete's sakes. But God says, "Freely you have received, freely give." Don't you know? I know how to give back to you. See, we're afraid. We are, we walk in fear instead of being free. We walk in fear. That's why, you know, I remember when, when God told me when my uncle came up because his sister was dying of cancer and I had my last thousand dollars in the bank. I said, well, Uncle John, if you find a way to get the money to come up, I'll give it back to you when you get here so that you can repay whoever it is that can lend you the money so you can come and see your sister before she dies because she's dying of cancer. Don't you know that uh, how God repaid me back because of the willingness I emptied my bank account? But the willingness to do that, God pays you back, and he doesn't just pay you back for what you give. He multiplies it back to you. That's the thing we have to understand. But we're so afraid that he's not going to do it. We're still <laughs> locked into just the physical and, and, and not the spiritual side of giving. God says, I can't bless you as you want to be blessed unless you do what I want you to do. Amen. It's not hard to understand if we could just follow his word. As he was teaching his disciples in this last week you remember jesus said there's many things that i need to tell you but you can't bear it all now there's a lot of stuff it's too heavy for you it's too heavy for you but when the spirit that i will send in my name comes he will bear all things to you he will tell you about me he will tell you about what you didn't hear from me he will instruct you in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So God is always trying to stretch out to help us to understand how we need to be so we can get the most, the, the, whole, the whole of what he wants from us and our walking before him. It's not hard church it's not hard we make it hard because we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to empty that bank account because when we start when we see that zero we say oh 
we start wondering, ah, uh, the yeah, first thing is, ah. Uh, <laughs> When you when when it should be setting you free, because you did what God wanted you to do, but we're still locked into what we see. You see, as long as I see it there, I have confidence in in what, in that, and not in God. You see why God does not want us to trust in Mammon, because as long as we have Mammon. We're going to trust in the mammon. I was in the hospital on, well, of course, you know, a few times. I can't remember if it was the first time or the second time, but, you know, in the hospital, all you have is a curtain between beds, right? And uh, this son came to visit his father. And uh, when he came there, you know, they're talking and so forth. And his father, his, his son asked him, his father, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm checking my account. What are you checking your account for? The account ain't going nowhere. He said, I just want, I just want to look at it. <laughs> said, father, I just want to look at it. Are you kidding me? The man is in the hospital. He ain't got nothing. To, he just wants to see it. That's where his trust is. That's where it's, it's not in God, not that, but it's in what He sees. If all you're trusting in is what you see, then you you lack the faith and belief in the God you say you believe in. So Jesus was teaching all the way, all the way. But now, of course, now we get to the point. After he cleanses the temple and he faced all kinds of accusations as to why is he doing this? And, you know, they mocked him. They, you know, what they, they were doing this all along, right? Mocking Jesus and turning him, uh, or telling him he wasn't God and so forth. But we know what happened. We know what happened at the end of the week. Those that uh, was supposed to love him, turn against him. He wept over Jerusalem. And the last thing I want you to get from this morning's word well, I had it Matthew chapter 26. And, we, and I'm done. Matthew 26, starting at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter. And two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on, ha, fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The timing, the life of Jesus, the son of the living God. He knew what was to happen. But he knew all along. The thing is, you can know something from a distance and it doesn't it affects you, but not to the point where it causes you to uh, how should I say it uh, stop you from doing what you would normally do on a daily basis. But now, what you have to do is is here. 
Now your sacrifice time is it's really here now. You know, you knew when you were born, when you were 12, that when you were 30, you're going to have to sacrifice yourself. But now the sacrifice is on you. And so now he's talking to his father about, oh, God, I'm going to be separated from you, not just physically, but spiritually. I don't know if I can bear this. I don't know if I can deal with this. Because it wasn't the nails, it wasn't the, the whipping. It was the separation from his father. Something that we will never understand. That kind of love from the beginning of time, where, wherever time began. God said, I was, I was always. So he, Jesus has been with Jehovah a long time. But now Jesus is, knows that I'm going to have to be separated from you, and I have never been separated from you. Not in this way. Oh, my God. But then he turns and says, but Father, I know why I, I was sent. I know why I'm here. Not my will, but thy will be done. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto them, Peter, what could not ye watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. But here is the crux of it, and I'm done. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is our problem. Our flesh is weak. We want to do for God. We want to earnestly do for God. But our flesh is weak. We Sometimes when we have to put up with certain things, uh, we don't want to have to put up with certain things. When, when God told me, when he took me out of my body and I stood over and saw myself, and when he spoke to me and said, you're going to have to suffer for me. He didn't say it's going to be a month. He didn't say a year. You're going to have to suffer for me. However long I'm going to keep you alive, you're going to have to suffer for me. You're going to have to bear witness to the truth as you go through, like there's nothing wrong. To glorify me. And to that I say, ah, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thy will be done, O Lord. How about you? Is there something that you're going through? You might have to go through to the end. For Jesus. For Jesus' sake. Can you say amen? Remember, you're going to meet him one day. Every time I open my eyes in the morning, I say, Lord, one day closer to going back home. Jesus. Because one day I'm going to see him. <sighs> one day. I'm going to want to hear those words. Well done. Our good and faithful servant. <laughs> Enter into the joy of the Lord. How about you? One day will be for you too. Let us pray.
Precious Lord God Almighty, holy and true. Once again, Lord God, we do praise and thank you for your word today. We praise and thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power of your word in our life. For the instruction of your word. Helping us, if we don't have it right, to get it right. And if we have it right, to keep it right. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for seeing something in us worth saving. How you separated us from a world that does not love you. Separating us so that we could love you as you want us to. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord God. As we come to this part of your life, where day by day you're getting closer to giving it up, we thank you, Lord God. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank and praise you. In Jesus' precious, most holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor John, for your message today, for breaking the bread of life unto us. And I echo, let not thy will be done, but thine, O Lord. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day. This Palm Sunday that we are celebrating, the Sunday before your resurrection. Lord, we pray that the ears that have heard, that it will give access, Lord, to their hearts, that it will be food to their souls, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Now we bid, bid for the uh benediction that you go in peace in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen Amen. Amen. A word of in agreement of what all that was said and done today. Amen. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us on this Palm Sunday service. I'm so grateful for God's presence. If you're able to join us a little while to fellowship, please do so. If you're unable to, don't forget to take Jesus with you, not only today, but throughout the week. 
And don't forget to read God's word. Amen. Amen. Love you all. Go in peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you Amen. That was beautiful, First Lady. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. And thank you for the word, Pastor. Amen. Thank you for letting him continue to use you. Amen.